Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're finally going to see why we've been studying matrices, just how powerful they are. We're going to use matrices to solve systems of linear equations. Consider the following system of linear equations. x plus y plus z equals 3, 2x minus 2y plus 3z equals negative 4, and negative x minus z equals 0. Notice that as long as we keep the variables in the same order for each equation, we can't swap it to y plus x plus z, we keep it in x, y, z every, th every time. We could write these coefficients to all the variables as a coefficient matrix, right? So we've got in front of this x is just a 1, in front of this y is just a 1, in front of this z is just a 1, so we can write a first row of 1, 1, 1. All of this coefficients that are on that row right there of the equation. For the next one we've got 2, negative 2, positive 3, so we put them all down here. So we've done that equation as the coefficients in that row showing up there. And since we can always trust that we're going to have the x, the y, and the z here because we're always staying in this order of x, y, z, that's why we have to keep the variables in the same order each time we can create this coefficient matrix. Finally, we've got negative 1 here, negative 1 here, so negative 1 and negative 1. And why do we have a 0? Well, if y doesn't show up, it must be because we have a 0y. So that's why we get a 0. So we've done all three equations, the coefficients to the variables in all three equations. So this idea of converting the information in a linear system into a matrix will allow us to explore ways that we can have linear systems interact with matrices and vice versa. How can a matrix allow us to solve a linear system of equations? Our first idea is the augmented matrix. We can take this idea of the coefficient matrix and expand on it. Instead of just representing coefficients for the equations, we can represent an entire linear system, the solutions included with an augmented matrix. So previously, we didn't have the constants for the equations, right? The, what was on the right side of the equal sign. So now we have that show up on the right side over here. So now we've got the coefficients and we have what each of those equations is equal to. So each row represents an equation of the system, right? x plus y plus z equals 3 is 1, 1, 1, 3 because that first one represents the coefficient on x, first one on the y, first one on the z, and it all comes together to equal 3 because we know it just additions what's going on between all those coefficients because it's a linear system. Each left side column gives a variable's coefficients, right? All of the coefficients to x show up here. We have 1, 2, and negative 1 on the x, and we've got 1, 2, and negative 1 in that uh, column as well on the left side. If a variable does not appear, it has a coefficient of 0. So this 0 is to show that we've got nothing for y here, because if you've got nothing, we can think of it as just 0 times y. The vertical line represents equalities, right? Since this vertical line here is representing each of these equal sign here. And finally, the right side column, this column here gives us, sorry, this column of our matrix is the constant terms from our equation. So we've got a way of converting that entire set of equations into a single matrix. So now we can look at how can we play around with this matrix to have it give up what those variables are equal to. Since we can represent a linear system as an augmented matrix, we can do operations on the matrix the same way we interact with a linear system. Anything that would make sense to do to a linear system, to an equation in a linear system, well, it should make sense. There should be a way to do it over on the matrix version because since we can do it to a linear system and the matrices are augmented matrix is just showing us a linear system, right? It's a way to portray a linear system. Then if we can figure out a way to interact with our matrix that's the same as interacting with a linear system, we know that it's just fine. So that comes that gives us the idea of three row operations. The first one is interchange the locations of two rows. So if I've got row one and row two, I can swap their places. Our next idea is to multiply or divide a row by a non-zero number. So I can multiply an entire row by 2 or by 5 or by negative 10, whatever I want to. Or divide by 2 because that's just the same thing as multiplying by 1 half, right? And then finally, add or subtract a multiple of one row to another. So if I've got row 2 here and row 5 here, I can have row 5 subtract twice on itself. So it's row 2 minus row minus two times row five, right? I can have a multiple of one row subtract from another one. So why does this make sense? How is this like a linear system? 
Well, all of these operations are completely reasonable if we had a linear system, right? If we have an equation here and an equation here, it's totally meaningless for us to swap the order that the locations, the, sorry, that the equations come in. The location of the equation isn't an important thing when we're working with a linear system. We just have to look at all of them. So it doesn't matter who came first and who came last. So we can move them around and it doesn't matter. So that means we can move our rows around and it doesn't matter because it's just representing a linear system. Similarly, multiplying both sides of an equation is just algebra, right? If I've got an equation, I can multiply two on the left side, two on the right side, and that's just fine. So you can think of that as multiplying each of the numbers inside of the equation. So if we multiply each of the numbers inside of the equation, that's the same thing as just multiplying an entire row of our augmented matrix. Finally, adding a multiple of an equation is elimination. Remember when we were talking about linear systems at first, elimination was we can add a multiple of one equation to another equation. Well, that's the same thing as adding a multiple of one row to another row over in the augmented matrix version. So everything here, there's a perfect parallel between the two ideas. Each one of our row operations makes total sense if we were just working with a linear system, and since our augmented matrix is just representing a linear system, they make sense over here with the augmented matrices as well. While row operations are a simple idea, each one of these is pretty simple, right? Swap, multiply, or add a multiple. Not that crazy. But working with them will involve a lot of arithmetic and steps. You're going to have a lot of calculations going on. And while none of them will probably be very hard calculations, you're going to be doing so many that it's easy to make mistakes. So when you're working on row operations, when you're working on doing this stuff, I want you to be careful with what you're doing and counter the fact that you're likely to make mistakes by noting each step. Note what you just did for each step. In addition to this being a good way to keep you from making mistakes, some teachers will simply require it and won't give you credit if you don't do it. And that's pretty reasonable because you'll definitely wind up making mistakes sooner or later if you don't do this sort of stuff. So take a note of what you did on each step. Show what you did between the first one and then the second one and then the third one by writing on the side what you just did. This will make it easier to avoid making mistakes and it will help you find any that manage to creep through. If you get to the end and you're like, this doesn't make sense, something must have gone wrong, you can go up and you can carefully analyze each of your steps and figure out where you made a mistake or maybe things actually do come out to be weird for some reason. So here are some suggested symbols for each of the three row operations. You don't have to use them. Whatever makes sense to you and if your teacher cares about it, whatever makes sense to your teacher. But these work well for me and I think they make sense pretty clearly. If we are interchanging row I and row J, so we're swapping their locations, I like just a little arrow left right between them. So we show some row by using a capital R to talk about a row and then the number of it. So for example, if we want to talk about the second row, we would just talk about it as R2. If we wanted to talk about the ninth row, it would be R sub 9, so on and so on. So for swapping row I and row J, we have RI, little arrow going back and forth, RJ. If we want to multiply row I by the number K, so we're multiplying by K, we just have K times row I. Simple as that. And finally, if we're adding a multiple of row I to row K, so we're adding a multiple then we've got KRI, K times rho I, the thing that we're adding the multiple of, to what, is being, what it's being added to. Cool. We'll see these pretty soon when we're actually starting to do some, uh, see how this stuff gets done. Gauss-Jordan elimination. Here's an idea. Since all of our row operations make sense for solving a linear system, right? They all make sense for a way to do it. We can apply them to find the value of each variable, right? If we manage to get our augmented matrix in a form like this form right here, if we manage to get our augmented matrix in that form, we'd immediately know what each variable is. Why? Well, notice this first row here, it's got 1, 0, 0. Well, 1 here would correspond to the x here, and then this guy here would be non-existent because there's two zeros there. So there'd be no y, there'd be no z, and we know that it's equal to negative 17. Exact same thing going on here. We know that y, because that's the y column, must be equal to 8. Nobody else shows up. And that z, since that's the z column, must be equal to 47. We've managed to solve the system by just moving stuff around in this augmented matrix. We know that that has to be true because that augmented matrix must be equivalent to the linear system because we turned our linear system into an augmented matrix and then we had all of these row operations that are just the same as working with a linear system. So what we have here is still the same as our original linear system so we can convert back to the linear system and see what our answers are. Cool. 
We call this format for a matrix reduced row echelon form. It's a mouthful, and it's kind of confusing at first. Echelon has something to do with a triangle shape, row echelon because the rows are kind of arranged in a triangle, reduced because they all start with ones and there's zeros. Honestly, don't really worry about it. Just sort of know reduced row echelon form, that really long name, and you'll be fine. While it has a formal definition, there is a way to formally define it. It's going to be enough for us to just think of it in this casual way, where it is a diagonal of ones. That main diagonal will have all ones on it. It will start at the top left, and it will continue down diagonally, and it will have zeros above and below. So we've got ones along the main diagonal, ones along the main diagonal, and above and below are ones. So there will be zeros above and below. So we've got a zero here above the ones and a zero here below the ones. We've got zeros here above the ones and zero here below the ones. Finally, the numbers on the far right. So the numbers on the far right can be any number. So over here, negative five, eight, it doesn't matter. Over here, we managed to have two columns because the reduced row echelon part, that's the one diagonals, sorry, the one diagonals part of the reduced row echelon form is just an identity matrix, so it can't get any farther than whatever the square portion of it would be. So we can wind up having multiple columns as well. But in our case, when we're working on this elimination to solve linear systems, we'll always only have a single column on the far right. Anyway, the point is that we've got this diagonal of ones, zeros above and below, and stuff on the far right can be any number. Now, from what we've just discussed, if we can use row operations to put an augmented matrix in reduced row echelon form, like this one right here, we will have solved its associated linear system because we'll know that since there's only one of a variable in that row, it must be equal to the constant on the other side of the augmented matrix, right? On the on the uh, right side of the augmented matrix past that vertical line that shows equality. So we'll have solved its associated linear system. Gauss-Jordan elimination, that's just named after the people who created it, is a method we can follow to produce reduced row echelon form matrices through row operations and thus solve linear systems. It's just a simple method of being able to, how do we get zeros to show up, zeros to show up, ones to show up on the diagonal, and then we're done. So it's just a method that we can follow through that will always wind up resulting in a reduced row echelon form. All right, so let's see how it's done. The very first thing you do for Gauss-Jordan elimination is you take your linear system and you write it in augmented matrix form. So we have our augmented matrix form over here. We look at the coefficients, we convert them over the line to show the equal signs, and then our constants on the far right side. All right, next thing is you use row operations to attain a one in the top left. So we start in the top left here and then zeros below. So we get a one here and then we wanted zeros below it, right? Because it's a one and zeros above and below. So we start off working with ones, creating ones, and then, well, sorry, from your point of view, creating ones and creating zeros underneath them. So we first get a one up here and then we create the zeros underneath it. Once we've done that, we move on to creating the next one diagonally down and doing zeros below that. And we just keep repeating until we've made it all the way down the diagonal. So you just keep going until you're all the way down the diagonal, creating ones and creating zeros below. So first off, we started with a one up here. So we already had the very first thing done. So our next step is how do we get this stuff to turn into zeros? So we do row operations, right? We want to get rid of this two. So since we've got row one has a one there, we subtract by two row one. 2 row 1 gets us minus 2 here, minus 2 here, so this becomes a 0. Minus 2 times 1 on negative 2 gets us negative 4. 1 times negative 2 added to 3 gets us 1. And negative 2 times 3 added to negative 4 gets us negative 10. Next up, we've got, we're adding row 1 because we need to get rid of this negative 1 here. So we add row 1 because it's positive 1. So add positive 1 to negative 1, we get 0. Add positive 1 to 0, we get 1. Add positive 1 to negative 1, we get 0. Add positive 3, because it's just a multiple. How many times is it going? So we're just adding whatever's on that first row, because it was just 1 of row 1. 3 on 0 gets us 3. All right, so at this point, we've got zeros below. Great, so now we're ready to move on to the next step in the diagonal. All right, so our next step in the diagonal is going to be this negative 4 here. We want to get that to turn into a 1. So we could do this by manipulating it with canceling things out or uh, by multiplying by dividing both sides by negative 4, by dividing that entire row by negative 4, multiplying the entire row by negative 1 fourth. But we might notice, oh, hey, I've already got a 1 here. Well, let's just use that, right? So if we swap 
these two rows, we'll manage to have a one in our next location. Great, we do that instead. So we say row two swap with row three, row two swap with row three, because up here they used to be row two and row three, and now they take their new spots, they swap locations, and we've got our new matrix right here. Next step, we see We've got the one here, so our next step is we need to turn this to a zero, turn everything below the ones to zeros on this first portion. So how do we do that? Well, we can add positive four times row two, because we have a one here, so we add four times that, and that'll cancel out the negative four. So four times one added to this gets us zero. Zero times four added to zero, we still have zero. Zero times four added to this, we just have one still. Three times four added to negative 10 gets us two. So at this point, notice we've got nothing but ones on our main diagonal, and we've got zeros all below it. However, we don't have zeros above it yet, right? There's things other than that, so that's the next step. So once you've got ones all along the main diagonal, and zeros all along the below that main diagonal, the next step is to cancel out the stuff above it. So our first thing is we work from the bottom right. So we work from the bottom right of the diagonal and we cancel out above the one. So you work your way up. So our first step is to cancel out everything here and here, but we notice because this row is zero, one, zero, we can actually do it in one step where we can subtract one of row three and one of row two. It's getting kind of hard to see with all those colors there. So subtracting one of row three, well, we've got one here, minus one. So now we subtract two on this. So we've got three minus two so far for what's going to show up here. Let's also subtract by row two, row two minus here. So one minus one, that comes out to be zero. Since it's zeros everywhere else on that row, we don't have to worry about them interfering except for over here. So we've got subtracting by another three. So three minus two minus three comes out to be equal to negative two and we get negative two here. At this point, we've got reduced row echelon form, right? We've got ones on the main diagonal, zeros above and below, so we can convert this. Our x here becomes negative two. The representative one of y here becomes three, so we have y equals three, and the representative one z becomes z equals two. So now we've solved the thing. And I want you to note, if there is no solution or infinitely many, if our linear system can't be solved or it has infinitely many solutions, this method will wind up not working. You will not be able to achieve reduced row echelon form if there is no solution or infinitely many solutions. So that's something to keep in mind. All right, a new way to do this. So we're gonna look at a total of three different ways to solve for solve linear systems, each using matrices. So another way to do this is through Kramer's rule. We can find the solutions to a linear system by this rule. Given a two variable system, we'll start with two by two to get a good understanding of what's going on, where we have the A's, each of our A's here is just a constant. So A11x, A12y, A21x, A22y is equal to constants on the right side, so B1 and B2, also constants. We can create a normal coefficient matrix. So A is the normal coefficient matrix, right? All of our coefficients, A11, A12, A21, A22, they show up just like they would normally in a coefficient matrix. Now, AX, what it's going to do is it's going to take this column here on A, and it's going to replace it with the constants to the equation. So it's going to replace a1, a2, 1 with this, and so we've got b1, b2 for that column, and then the rest of a like normal. Similarly, for y, we're going to swap out the y constants from a, and so we're going to have a like normal, except we swap out the constant column for where the y variables were occupying. The y column gets swapped to the constant column. So constant column goes in there. So notice that AX is just like A, except it has these constants, this constant column, replacing the X column. Similarly, AY has the constant column replacing the Y column from our normal coefficient matrix. All right, so that's the idea. Now, if the system has a single solution, if it comes out to be just one solution, it isn't infinitely many, it isn't no solutions at all, if the system has a single solution, then X will be equal to the determinant of AX over the determinant of A. So the determinant of its special matrix divided by the determinant of the general coefficient matrix. Similarly, 
y is going to be equal to the determinant of its special matrix divided, divided by the determinant of the general coefficient matrix. Okay. This method can be generalized to any linear system with n variables. So let A be the coefficient matrix for this n variable linear system. Let AI be the same as A, except the ith column. So the column that represents the variable we're currently working with, the variable that we want to solve for, that column will be replaced with the column of constants. So we replace the column for the variable we're interested in solving for with the column of constants, and that makes A for whatever variable we were looking for, AI in this case if we're looking for the ith variable, right, up until we're looking for the ith one. From the linear system, so our uh, we replace it with the column of constants from the linear system. That's just the right side of the equation. It's the b1, b2 on our previous 2 by 2 example. Okay, that idea in mind, if the determinant of A, the determinant of our normal coefficient matrix right up here, is not equal to 0, if the determinant of A is not equal to 0, then the ith variable xi, this variable we're trying to solve for, is equal to the determinant of its special matrix that has that column replacing, divided by the determinant of the normal coefficient matrix. That's what we have right here. So it's just like in the 2 by 2 form, except we can do it on a larger scale as well. You swap out this one column, you take the determinant of that special matrix, you divide it by the determinant of the normal uh, coefficient matrix, and that's equal to whichever, that gives you the variable for whatever column had swapped. We'll get the chance to see this done on a uh, more confusing scale, which is the sort of thing that we want to be able to understand this on a larger scale, uh, in example three, and we'll just see this get applied normally in example two for a two by two matrix. Also, notice if the determinant of A is equal to zero, then the system will have either no solutions or infinitely many solutions. All right. Final method to do this is we can solve with inverse matrices. This one's my, perfect, my personal favorite for understanding how this stuff works. I think it's the easiest to understand, but that's maybe just me. Using matrix multiplication, we can write a linear system as an equation with matrices. So why, how can we do this as an equation? It made sense for an augmented matrix because we talked about the special thing, but how is 1, 1, 1, 2, negative 2, 3, negative 1, 0, negative 1? Notice that that's just our normal coefficient matrix A showing up here, our normal coefficient matrix A here. If we multiply it by the column matrix X, Y, Z equals our coefficient column here, so we've got our coefficient column here, that winds up being, e being just the same. It's completely equivalent. These two ideas here are completely equivalent. Multiplying the matrices versus the linear system, linear system versus the matrices being multiplied together, they're completely the same. Let's see why. So just do some basic matrix multiplication on this. So what's going to come out of this? We've got a 3 by 3, 3 rows by 3 columns, 3 rows by 1 column. So yes, they match up, so they can multiply. So that's going to produce a 3 by 1, a 3 row by 1 column matrix in the end. So let's see what's going to get made out of this. We're going to have a 3 by 1. Our first row times the first column, the only column. So that's 1, 1, 1. So let's make this a little bit larger so we can see the full size of what's going to go in. So 1 times x plus 1 times y plus 1 times z is x plus y plus z. Next, 2, negative 2, 3 on x, y, z gets us 2x minus 2y plus 3z. Finally, negative 1, 0, negative 1 on x, y, z gets us negative x plus 0y, so let's just leave it blank, minus z. Now, if we know that that is equal to our coefficient matrix, because we set it from the beginning, then all we're saying, 3, negative 4, 0, well, for two matrices to be the same thing, for them to be equal to each other, every entry must be equal. Each entry in the two matrices has to be equal to its entry in the same location. So the top one, x plus y plus z, equals 3. Hey, that's just the exact same thing as this. 2x minus 2y plus 3z has to be equal to negative 4. Well, that's the same thing as saying 2x minus 2y plus 3z is equal to negative 4. And same thing, negative x minus z, saying it's equal to 0 through the matrices, is the same thing by saying it is the linear system. So the linear system taken as a whole is just the same thing as taking the coefficient matrix, multiplying it by this coefficient column matrix, and that's going to come out to be equal to our constant matrix, what was the constants for the equations. So that's the idea that's going to 
really be the driving force behind using inverse matrices. All right, so we can symbolically write this whole thing as A x b, a times x equals b, where a is the coefficient matrix. So that's the coefficient matrix right here. Then x is a single column matrix of the variables. So that's our x, y, z, whatever the variables we wind up using with are going to go like that. And then finally, B is a single column matrix of the constants. So 3, negative 4, 0 gets the same thing right here. Okay. Notice, if we could somehow get X alone, if we could get our variable matrix, our variable column alone on one side, whatever was on the other side, if it equals numbers on the other side in a matrix, then we'd have solved for it because we say X is equal to whatever the corresponding location is on the other side. Y is equal to whatever its corresponding location is on the other side. Z is equal to whatever its corresponding location is on the other side. We'd have solved for this. So if we can somehow get X alone, we'll be done. Well, we'll have figured out what x, y, and z are equal to. How can we do that, though? How can we get rid of a? Through inverse matrices. No surprise, since this thing's titled inverse matrices, right? So we cancel out a. If a is invertible, then there exists some a inverse, right? There exists some a inverse. We can multiply that by that will cancel out a. So we start off with ax equals b. So we can multiply by a inverse on the left side on both sides. Remember, if you multiply by the left, if you multiply by the left and the right, for matrices, matrix equations, that doesn't work. You have to always multiply both from the left, sorry, both from the left or both from the right. You're not allowed to do them on opposite sides. They have to both be coming from the same side when you multiply. So we multiply by A inverse on the left side on both cases. The A inverse here and the A cancel out. We're left with just X equals A inverse B. So if we can compute A inverse and then we can compute what is A inverse times B, we'll have solved our system. We'll have what our system is equal to. So just make sure that you multiply from the same side for your inverse on both sides of the equation. You have to multiply both from the left, otherwise it won't work out. Finally, if A is not invertible, if the determinant of A is equal to zero, you can't invert it, then that means that the system has either no solutions or infinitely many solutions. All right, let's try putting these things to use. Uh, oh, sorry, before we get into using them, the mighty graphing calculator. So all of these methods work great for solving linear systems. Augmented matrices with Gauss-Jordan elimination, Kramer's rule, inverse matrices. They're all great ways to solve linear systems, but they all have the downside of being really tedious. They take so much arithmetic to use, right? We can work through it. We can see that we can do this stuff, but it's going to take us forever to actually work through this stuff by hand. I've got great news. Turns out, if you have a graphing calculator, you can already do this right now really fast, really quickly, really easily. Almost all graphing calculators have the ability to do matrix and vector operations. So you can enter matrices into your calculator and then you can multiply them. You can take determinants of the matrices, you can find inverses, or you can put them in reduced row echelon form. So look on your graphing calculator if you have a graphing calculator for something that talks about where, if just look for a button about matrices, look for something like that. And they'll probably have more information about how to create a matrix and then how to do stuff with it. Uh, inverse is probably just raising the, raising the matrix to the negative one, and they'll spit out the value. Each graphing calculator will wind up being a little bit different for how it handles inputting the matrices, but they'll all have this ability, almost all of them for sure. Um, if you have real difficulty figuring out how to do it on your calculator, just do a quick internet search for name of your calculator, put in matrices, use matrices, and you'll totally be able to figure out an easy way to do it very quickly. Someone has a guide up somewhere. Also, if you don't have a graphing calculator, don't despair. It's still possible to get this stuff done really easily, really quickly. There's lots of websites out there where you can do these things for free. Just try doing a quick internet search for matrix calculator. Just simply search the words matrix and calculator and the first like five hits will all be matrix calculators where you can plug in matrices and you can normally multiply them or you can take the determinants or you can get their inverses or you can do other things that you don't even know you can do with matrices yet but just look for the things that you're looking for lots of things you can do with so just do a quick internet search the word matrix I'm sorry the words matrix and calculator and you'll be able to find all sorts of stuff for this so even if you don't have a graphing calculator there's lots of things out there if you're watching this video right now you can go find websites that will let you do this for free finally while this is great that we can do all this stuff with a calculator and the calculator will do the work for us, I still want to point out it's important to be able to do this stuff without a calculator. So it makes it so much easier 
to be able to use a calculator, but we still have to understand what's going on underneath the hood. We don't have to constantly be using it, but we have to have a, some sense of what's going on the hood, under the hood if we're going to be able to understand more higher complex level stuff in later classes. So you want to be able to understand this stuff just because you want to be able to understand things if you're going to be able to make sense of things that come later. And also, you usually need to show your work on your tests, right? Your teacher's not going to be very happy if you're taking a test and you just say, yeah, my calculator said it right. You're not going to get any points for that. So you can't just get away with it all the time. That said, it can be a great help for checking your work so you can work through the thing by hand and then just do a quick check on your calculator to tell you, yeah, you got the problem right. That's really useful on test. Or if you're dealing with really huge matrices where it's like, you know, four by four, five by five, six by six, or even larger, where you can't reasonably be able to do that by hand, you just use a calculator and that's perfectly fine. All right. Now let's get on to the examples. First example, using Gauss-Jordan elimination, solve 2x plus 5y equals negative 3, 4x plus 7y equals 3. So our very first thing to do is we need to convert it into an augmented matrix. We've got 2 as the first coefficient on the x, and then 5 as the first coefficient on the y, and that equals negative 3. So there's our bar there. 4, 7, 3. So we've converted it into a coefficient, sorry, into an augmented matrix, right? Our coefficients are on the left part of the matrix and our constant terms are on the right part of the matrix. All right. So at this point, we just start working through it, right? So we need to do our, the very first thing we need to do is we need to get that to turn into a one, the top left corner to turn into a one. So we'll do that by multiplying the first row one half times row one. Right, so that's what we'll do there. 2 times 1 half becomes 1. 5 times 1 half becomes 5 over 2. Negative 3 times 1 half becomes negative 3 halves. 4, 7, 3. Bottom row didn't get touched, so it just stays there. Next thing to do, we want to get this to turn into a 0. So we will subtract the top row top row is not going to wind up doing anything on this step, but we will subtract the top row four times, because we've got four here. So minus four R1 plus our second row. So one, four, sorry, negative four times one plus four gets us zero. Negative four times five halves gets us negative 10. Negative 10 plus seven gets us negative three. Negative three halves times negative four gets us positive six, right? We've got positive six out of that. So that gets us positive 9. Our next step, we want to get this to turn into a 1. We'll bring this whole thing up here. So bring that up there. Next step is to get the second row to turn to a 1. 1, 5 halves, negative 3 halves. So we multiply the bottom part by negative 1 third times row 2. So 0 times negative 1 third, still 0. Negative 3 times negative 1 third becomes positive 1. 9 times negative 1 third becomes negative 3. At this point, we can now turn this into a 0. Don't need to do anything to our bottom row. Still 0, 1, negative 3. But we will add negative 5 halves of row 2 to row 1. So 0 times anything, still going to be zero, so added there, still one there. Then negative five halves on one plus five halves becomes zero. Negative five halves times negative three becomes plus 15 halves, and then still minus three halves. So let's simplify that. So we've got one, zero, zero, one. 15 halves minus three halves becomes 12 over two. 12 over two is six. Six, negative three. So at this point, we can convert that into answers. X equals 6, y equals negative 3. And there are our answers. However, we did have to do a whole lot of calculation to get to this point, right? And it could be even more if we were working on a larger augmented matrix. It gets big really fast. So it might be a good idea to do a quick check. So let's just check our work, make sure it is correct. So let's plug it into the first one, 2 times 6 plus 5 times negative 3. What does that come out to be? We hope it will come out to be negative 3. 12 plus negative 15 equals negative 3. Indeed, that's true. We could check it again with this equation as well if we want to be really, really extra careful. 4 times 6 plus 7 times negative 3 equals positive 3. 24 minus 21 equals 3. That's true. So both of our checks worked out. We know that x equals 6, y equals negative 3. Definitely a solution. Great.
All right, second example, let's see Kramer's rule in action. So the first thing we want to do if we're going to use Kramer's rule is we need to get a coefficient matrix going. So A equals, what are our coefficients here? So we've got a 2 by 2, 2, 5, 4, 7. So there's the coefficients. Our next step is we want AX. What's AX going to be? So here is our X column. So we're going to swap that out for the constants here. So negative 3 and 3 replaces what had been our x column here, and then the rest of it is just like normal. So we replace that one column, but everything else is just the same. a y, what will a y be? Same sort of thing, except now we're replacing the y column. What's the y column going to turn into? It's going to also become negative 3, 3. So 2, 4, just as it was before, the first column is still the same because that's the x column, but now we're swapping out the y column, so it becomes the constants, negative 3 and 3. All right, so we were told that Kramer's rule so says x is equal to the determinant of its special swapped out matrix Ax divided by the determinant of the normal coefficient matrix. So the determinant of negative 3, 5, 3, 7 divided by the determinant of 2, 5, 4, 7. Negative 3 times 7 gets us negative 21 minus 3 times 5, 15. Over 2 times 7, 14 minus 4 times 5, 20. So we've got negative 36 over negative 6 equals, that comes out to be positive 6. So we now have x equals positive 6. Hey, that checks out with what we just did in the previous one. If you didn't notice, these equations are the same as what they were in the previous example. So we're just seeing two different ways to do the same problem. Well, at least the part where we're trying to solve for x and y. So that checks out because we checked it in the previous problem. Now, what about y? y is going to be the same thing. y is equal to the determinant same structure at least, of AY, its special matrix, divided by the determinant of A once again. So we could calculate the determinant of A, but hey, we already calculated the determinant of A, right? We figured out that it comes out to be negative 6, so we just drop in negative 6 here. You only have to do it once, right? It's not going to change. The determinant of A will stay the determinant of A as long as A doesn't change. Then the determinant of AY, we don't know what AY is. We don't know what that special matrix is yet. 2, negative 3, 4, 3. So, 2 times 3, 6, minus 4 times negative 3, negative 12. That cancels out, so we've got 6 plus 12 divided by negative 6. 18 over negative 6 equals negative 3, so y comes out to be negative 3. Once again, that is the same answer as we got on the previous example, so we know that this checks out. If you had just done this for the very first time, I'd recommend doing a check, because once again, you have to do a lot of arithmetic to get to this point, and it's going to be even more if you're doing a larger Kramer's rule, like, say, this guy. All right, so if we're working on this one, we only have to solve for the value of y. There's one slight downside to only solving for one variable. It means you can't check your work because we can't plug in y and be sure that it works out to be true, but we can at least get out what it should be. All right, so using Kramer's rule, the first thing we need to do is we need to figure out what is our coefficient matrix A. A equals, so all of our first variables is w, so 2w. 3w, there's no w there at all, so it must be 0w, negative 2w. Next, our x's. No x's in the first equation, so it's 0x's, negative 2, negative 3, positive 5. Next up, 4y, 1y, 2y, 0y, negative 1z, 4z, 0z, 1z. Great. Now, we're looking to figure out what is y going to be. So we figure out a y is going to be the same thing, except it's going to have its y column swapped. Notice that the y column is the third column in, so we're going to swap out the third column for the constants. Other than that, it's going to look like our normal coefficient one. So we can copy two, whoops, copy over what we had in the previous one, except for that one column, two, three, zero, negative two, 0, negative 2, negative 3, 5. Now, this is the third column, this one right here. So we're swapping out for the, the constants column, the column of constants. So that's 5, 16, 0, 17. And then back to copying the rest of it, negative 1, 4, 0, 1. So at this point, we have a y, we have a. So we're going to need to figure out determinants. First, let's figure out what is the determinant of A. So the determinant of A, if we want to figure out this guy here, 
So remember, if we're going to be figuring out determinants, we're going to be using cofactor expansion. So the very first thing we want to do is we want to make a little plus minus field, plus minus, plus minus, minus, plus minus, plus plus minus, plus minus, minus plus minus plus. So we can use that as a reference point. So which one would be the best one if we're looking to get the determinant of a? So the determinant of a. If we're looking to get the determinant of a, which would be the best row or column to expand on? I see two zeros on this column, so let's work off of that one. So the first zero. Right, that just disappears because it's zero times its cofactor. Blow out that cofactor because it's zero. Next one is negative three. So negative three, we are on the third row, second column. So that corresponds to that symbol, a negative. So it's negative and then negative three, what we have for our, what we're expanding around. Negative, negative three, so minus negative three. Then times, what happens if we cut out everything on line with that negative three? We've got two, three, negative two, 4, 1, 0, negative 1, 4, 1. I have to keep going. So now we're on the 2. Let's swap to a new color. So 2 here. We are on a plus now. So it is plus 2 times cut out what's on line with that 2. So we've got 2, 3, negative 2, 0, negative 2, 5, negative one, four, one. All right, at this point, we want to figure out which is the easiest rows to expand on or columns to expand on. For these two matrices, I notice there's a zero here and a zero here. I personally find it easier to do expanding based on a row than based on a column, so I'll just choose to do rows. So negative, negative three, these cancels to positive three. So positive three times expand on negative two first. So, oh, and we're on a three by three now, so we're on that plus there, so it is still positive. So it's three times. Now we're figuring out the determinant of that matrix. So negative two times, cross out what's on line with that, four, negative one, one, four. P minus zero, but minus zero, that cancels out. So what's next after that? Another plus, plus one times, so one times, cross out what's on line with that one here. Two, four, three, one. All right. Let's work on our other half, the other determinant. So plus two times whatever the determinant is inside of this matrix. So two here, two is a positive here because it's in the top left. So two times whatever's on line with that, we get negative two, whatever's on line gets canceled out. So we're left with negative two, four, five, one. And then zero next, so the zero here, don't have to worry about it. And then we're finally on to a plus, but it's a negative one. So plus negative one times, cross out what's on line with the negative one. We're left with three, negative two, negative two, five. Okay. This point, we just have a lot of, a lot of arithmetic to work through. Three, negative two, take the determinant of this matrix. So we have four times four, that's 16, 16 minus negative one gets us positive 17. Plus one times, so forget about the one, two times one is two minus three times four, 12. So two minus 12 is negative 10. Plus two times two times, negative two times one is negative two minus five times four, 20. So negative two minus 20 is negative 22. Plus negative one, so let's make it a negative times three times five, 15, minus negative four, sorry, three times five, 15, minus negative two times negative two, so positive four, so three times five, 15, plus four, 19, right? If you have difficulty doing that in your head, just write out the two by two as well. Keep working through this, three times, negative two times 17 comes out to be negative 34. Got negative 34 minus 10, plus two times, two times negative 22 is negative 44 minus 19. Three times negative 44 plus two negative 44 minus 19 becomes negative, uh, oh, whoops, a mistake got made. Ah, here it is. 
I just caught my mistake. See how easy it is to make mistakes here? That should be an important point is to be really, really careful with this. Really easy to make mistakes. 3 times 5 is 15 minus negative 2 times negative 2. So let's work this one out carefully. 3 times 5 minus negative 2 times negative 2. Well, these cancel out. We're left with positive 4. So 15 minus 4 becomes 11. So this shouldn't be 19. It should be 11. So this shouldn't be a 19 here either. It should be 11. So minus negative 44 minus 11 becomes negative 55. See how easy it is to make mistakes? I make mistakes. It's really easy to make mistakes. Be very careful with this sort of stuff. It's really, really, it's a sad way to wind up missing stuff when you understand what's going on, but it's just one little tiny arithmetic error. All right, let's finish this one out. 3 minus 44, 3 times negative 44 becomes negative 132 plus 2 times negative 55 becomes minus 110. We combine those together and we get negative 100, sorry, not negative 100, negative 242. So negative 242, the determinant of A is equal to negative 242. Woof, takes a while to work through, doesn't it? All right, next one. Figured out the determinant of A, that comes out to be negative 242. So to use Kramer's rule, we know that Y is going to be equal to the determinant of AY over the determinant of A. So we now need to figure out what is AY come out to be. So determinant of AY, let's figure this out. We work through this one. I notice is this nice row right here. We've got three zeros on it. That's going to make it easy to work through. If we're doing a cofactor expansion, we want to make our sign table. Okay, so we can work along with that. So our first one is a plus on zero, but that doesn't matter. Next one is a minus on negative three. So minus negative three on, we expand, we cut out what's on line with that negative three. So we've got 2, 3, negative 2, 5, 16, 17, negative 1, 4, 1. Next up, 0. Once again, don't have to worry about that. Next up, 0. Once again, don't have to worry about that. All right. So we see these cancel out, and we've got 3 times... Now we need to choose who are we going to expand along, which row or column. Personally, I like the top call, sorry, top row. I like expanding along rows and two, five, negative one. Those at least have some kind of small numbers. So I'll expand across that just because I feel like it. So two, five, negative one. We'll do it in three different colors here. So two corresponds to this. So it is a positive two times what cuts along this. We're left with 16, 17, four, one. Next one, do with green. That corresponds to a negative there. So that's minus five. What does it cut out? Left with three, negative two, four, one. And then finally, go back to red. Negative one corresponds to positive. So plus negative one times what does it cross out? We've got 3, negative 2, 16, 17 left. All right, so work this out. So we've got 3 times all of this stuff, 2 times 16 times 1, 16, minus 17 times 4. 17 times 4 comes out to be minus 68. Next one, minus 5 times, 3 times 1 is 3, minus negative 2, well, 3 after that mistake last time. Let's be careful. Minus negative 2 times 4 is negative 8. So that'll cancel out to plus. Finally, we'll turn this to a minus since it was times negative 1. 3 times 17, 3 times 17, that comes to 51. Minus negative 2 times 16 becomes negative 32. Okay, keep working this out. 3 times 2 times 16 minus 68 is negative 52. Minus 5 times 3 plus 8 is 11. Minus 51 minus 
negative 32 becomes 51 plus 32. 51 plus 32 is minus 83. Okay. So 3 times 2 times negative 52 becomes negative 104. Minus 5 times 11 becomes negative 55 and still minus 83. We combine all of those together and that gets us 3 times negative 242. Now you could go through and multiply this together and you'd get a number out of it. But notice, we've got negative 242 here and later on in just a few moments we're about to divide by that previous determinant a at negative 242. So why don't we just leave this as 3, negative, three times negative 242 that's equal to the determinant of a sub y, our special matrix for a sub y. So at this point we know from Kramer's rule y equals, cut out a little space for it, y equals the determinant of its special matrix a sub y divided by the determinant of the coefficient matrix. We figured out the determinant of the coefficient matrix is negative, sorry, we figured out the determinant of our special matrix is 3 times negative 242, so 3 times negative 242 divided by the determinant of our coefficient matrix, that's also negative 242. Hey, negative 242 over negative 242, those parts cancel out, and we are left with 3, so y equals 3. Sadly, there's no good way to check it at this point if we're going to have to work through the whole thing, because we'd have to solve for each one of them, x and, sorry, w and x and z. On the bright side, solving for w, x, and z is only having to figure out the determinant of ax a, sorry, A, W, A, X, and A, Z, because we already figured out the determinant of A, but still clearly takes some effort to take the determinants of even just a size 4 by 4, so it's pretty difficult. However, if you've got a graphing calculator, it would be pretty easy to go through and enter the matrix and then take its, you know, enter an augmented matrix, including the uh, constants, and then get the reduced row echelon form and see if y equals 3 pops out as the answer that you'd have from it. It would be the case that, that would be, that's what you'd get out of it. Or you could use uh, Kramer's rule and do determinants on figure out what ax is, figure out what aw is, figure out what az is, and then be able to plug them all in and check afterwards. Or you could also go through and do it with inverse matrices and see if y comes out to be 3 once you figured out that on your calculator. So you can do this stuff by hand if you have to do it on a test, but then you can also, if you're allowed to use the calculator, you just have to show your work, you can check your work in a second different way to make sure that your work did come out to be true so you can definitely get the uh, problem right. All right, final example. Do you remember that monster from solving systems of linear equations? It's back and we're gonna solve it. We're gonna knock out this thing that was way too difficult for us then. It's gonna be a piece of cake for us now because we've got access to how inverse matrices work. We can use calculators to be able to calculate an inverse matrix very quickly. This thing's gonna be a cinch. Our game plan, remember the idea was that we have the coefficient matrix A times the column of the variables is equal to the column of the constants. So AX equals B. If we can figure out what A inverse is, we can multiply by A inverse on the left side on both cases. A inverse cancels out there, and we're left with X equals A inverse times B. We already know what B is. B is this thing right here. So that part's pretty easy. Can we figure out what A inverse is? Well, this is A. So we've got access to a graphing calculator. I'm assuming we have access to a graphing calculator, some way to do matrix calculations. Once again, matrix calculations, easy to do, but crazy tedious. They take all of this time. It's easy to make a mistake because just doing 100 calculations, you tend to make a mistake in there. But that's what calculators, that's what computers are for. That's why humans invented those sorts of things, is to be able to make tedious calculations like that go away, where we can trust the calculator to do the you know number crunching part, and we can trust us to do the thinking part, hopefully. So. We figure out what is A. So we figure out A is, it's going to be a big one, our U's first, 1U, negative 4U, 1U, negative 2, 1 fifth U, 2U. Next up our V's, 2V, 2V, 1V, 1 half V, negative 3V, positive 4V, 7W, 1W, 0W, because it didn't show up, 3w, negative 1w, negative 1w, negative 3x, 1 third x, 0x, 0x, 2x, negative 3x, 
4y, 2y, 1y, 2y, negative 1y, 5y, 2z, 1z, 1z, 4z, 4z, 0z. So what you do is you take a and you enter that into your graphing calculator, right? You put that into a graphing calculator. You put that into some sort of matrix calculator. So you enter this into a calculator or a computer or something that is able to get work with matrices. Lots of programs are because matrices are crazy useful. They're, once again, we aren't even beginning to scratch the surface of how useful they are. We're just getting some sense with this one problem. So you enter this whole thing into a calculator. Then you tell the calculator, take the inverse. So we do that. And I want to point out, before we actually go on to talk about the inverse, you tell the calculator, take the inverse. Before you do that, double check that you entered the matrix correctly, right? If you entered this wrong, if you enter this big A, 6 by 6, that's 36 numbers that you just put into your calculator. Chances are you might have accidentally entered one of them wrong. You enter one of them wrong, your entire answer is going to get screwed up. Chances are it'll get screwed up and be this awful decimal number. So you'll go, well, my teacher probably didn't give me something that would come out to be an awful decimal number. But if you're working in something like physics where you don't already know what the answer is going to be, it's up to you to make sure you get it right in get it incorrectly the first time. So double check if you're entering a very large matrix, make certain that you enter that matrix correctly. So we've got the entire matrix set up in our calculator and we've double checked that it's correct. Now we punch out A inverse. So on most calculators, that's going to wind up being take the matrix, raise it to the negative one. What does it come out to be? It comes out to be sinfully ugly. It is awful. For example, the very first term is going to be 1,780 divided by 1,400, sorry, 14, 1,131. The second column, first row, first row, second column would be 45 divided by 1,000, 14,131. The third, oh, yeah, 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 this is awful. Ugh. So what are we going to wind up doing? We have to write the whole thing down. No, we don't have to write the whole thing down. It's in our calculator. We just tell the calculator A inverse and then we don't have to worry about A inverse at all. We don't have to figure out and write the whole thing down on paper. There's no need for it. The calculator will keep track of what the numbers for A inverse are because all we're concerned about is taking A inverse and applying it against B. So we leave in the calculator. We know X is going to be equal to A inverse times B, right? That's what we just figured out from our game plan of thinking about this. So we have in our calculator, a inverse is in there. We have it in the calculator. We don't have to actually see what the whole thing is because it is already there. What is our B? We enter in the column matrix 41, 39, 4, 23, negative 30, 44. We make sure that our A inverse is multiplying from the left side. Otherwise, it won't work at all. And what does this wind up coming out to be? This comes out to be the deliciously simple negative 5, 4, 1, negative 3, 6, negative 1. So we just figured out x equals our x as all of our, um, all of our variables at once. Well, x is equal to what were all of our variables? It was u. And then we put in v, and then we put in w, and then we put in x, y, z. So they go that order in our column, u, v, w, x, y, z equals this thing that we just punched out, negative 5, 4, 1, negative 3, 6, negative 1. So u equals negative 5, v equals 4, w equals 1, x equals negative 3, y equals 6, z equals negative 1. If we really wanted to at this point, we could check it, right? We could plug each one of these into any one of these equations, and if it came out right, chances are we probably got the entire thing right. So it might not be a bad idea to check at that point. But also, as long as we were really careful with entering in our a and careful with entering in our column of constants, our b, Everything should have worked out fine there. Otherwise, there's some other error that cropped up. So it becomes really, really easy with just a little bit of thinking and this calculator to take, for, take care of the awful grunt work of the numbers of just having to crunch through that many numbers. As long as we've got the calculator to be able to do that part so it's quick and easy and we can trust that it came out right and we're able to do the thought of what's going on, we see that A inverse, our coefficient matrix inverted, times are the... Uh, what the equations come out to be, our constant column matrix, just comes out to be the answers for each one of them. Really cool, really fast, really easy. So anytime you've got a large, uh, a large linear system or even a small linear system and you just want to check it, boom, you can have it done like that if you've got access to a matrix calculator.
pretty cool. All right, we'll see you at educator.com later. Bye.